Welcome back Defenders, Jake here. In today's video, I wish I had something amazing to tell you. I wish I could tell you that Ukraine destroyed another submarine, destroyed the bridge again, destroyed the Black Sea Fleet headquarters again, destroyed another $300 million A-50 plane. I don't have any news like that today. For the next two months, this is going to be very difficult for Ukraine. Ukraine has to hold the line and just wait. Wait for the arrival of these million shells from the Czech Initiative. Wait for the US Congress to pass military aid. And I might not have a lot of good news over the next two months. So to start this video, if you could give this video a thumbs up, it helps with the YouTube algorithm. Videos with sad stories don't do as well as videos that involve expensive Russian military assets being blown up. So we're going to start with the city of Kharkiv because this is important. Russian attack kills seven in Ukraine's Kharkiv. Russia launched another three cruise missiles and 28 Iranian Shahid drones. And Kharkiv can't defend itself. Ukraine lacks the resources for proper air defense anymore, given that MAGA Republicans have been blocking additional military aid for over six months. The city of Kharkiv is Russia's number one target right now, and it's being struck every single night. Ten people were killed and 48 were injured across all of Ukraine. Ten high-rise buildings, 20 private homes, three dormitories, two administrative buildings, a gas station. 20 cars and various critical infrastructure were all damaged last night in Ukraine. And here's a story I have to share. This is a follow-up on all the thermal power plants in Kharkiv being destroyed. This is a worker who survived the attack, explaining what their job entailed, and they all knew the risks. That's our job, you know. Someone is fighting on the front line, and we have our own front. This is what one of the power plants in Ukraine looks like after Russian shelling. The engine room was destroyed, and the control room was burned down. It was all on fire. Operations were right here. There can be several air raid alerts a day. We can't shut down and stop the units. When there is an air raid alert, so the operating personnel minimum needed to control a power units uh, remain here. Some workers were killed at a job as a result of Russian shelling. Russia is deliberately shelling Ukraine's energy infrastructure. This is the control room for one of Kharkiv's thermoelectric power plants. When the air raid sirens go off, non-essential personnel go into the shelters but there are still operators in the control room. The city still needs power. And these operators knew they were Russia's number one target. Kharkiv was low on air defense systems and that if there was a direct hit, they would all be killed. I don't know how many of these power plant operators died in this attack, but they gave their lives for their country. Here's a post from Kate from Kharkiv. She's Ukrainian. I want to read her story. Life in Kharkiv becomes more and more surreal and difficult by the day. I attempt to maintain focus, but air raid alerts shudder my concentration. They pierce through walls, through thoughts. Sleep, once a sanctuary, now offers no solace as shockwaves and deafening sounds of explosions wrench me out of it. Every explosion is a life lost, and I pray, all gods, it's not my loved ones. Before saying goodbye, I hold them tightly as disgusting, sticky fear of loss creeps under my skin. Please survive goes through my mind. Please be okay. I cannot bear to lose you. And as they step into the uncertain day, I offer a brave facade and say, I'll see you soon. We need help. We need help desperately. So these are the games that the Russians play. 
Here's the drones and the missiles. And just look at the flight paths. Every night is a test. In experiments by the Russians launching these drones and missiles, trying to go around some of Ukraine's air defense systems, seeing which ones still have missiles, which ones are still active, and then hitting their targets. President Zelensky says Ukraine needs 25 Patriot air defense systems to cover the entire country. So to give overlapping protection across all of Ukraine, Ukraine's a very big country, they would need 25 uh, Patriot units. Each Patriot unit, uh, there's the control vehicle, the radar, and uh, the launchers. There's about six to eight launchers per unit. And a single Patriot unit is worth about $1.1 billion. It's pretty expensive. Here's a thought from Anne Applebaum. She's a contributor for The Atlantic. There are Patriot batteries and ammunition all over the world that could have saved Kharkiv, once a thriving city of 2 million people, but no one was willing to donate them. I don't know what the official number to date is, but I think Ukraine has received about four to five Patriot units, six to eight launchers in each unit. But across the world, there are more than 240 Patriot fire units that have been built by Raytheon. A lot of these units are still sitting in their shrink wrap in NATO inventories. They could have been donated. They could have been given to Ukraine. But no country that has a Patriot launching unit wants to sacrifice their own air defense systems to save the city of Kharkiv. Ukraine announces mandatory evacuation for children from 52 settlements in the Sumy Oblast. Russia is still coming for the children of Ukraine. Sumy on the map is located right here. We've got Chernihiv up here. Kharkiv is uh, a little bit farther south. So the rumors, the buzz, the speculation that everyone's talking about is that the Russians want to open up a new front this summer coming from the Chernihiv region, the Sumy region, or going for the city of Kharkiv. I think Russia desperately wants a real win. When they took the city of Bakhmut in early 2023, trolls who support Russia were saying, this is it, this is the breakthrough. We're now going to get a lot, like a breakthrough in the Donbass region. But no, they took the city of Bakhmut and it didn't cause any kind of domino effect. The same is true for Avdivka. Given the struggle and the fights and the horrendous losses the Russians took, people who support Russia were saying, well, this is a domino effect. There's going to be a breakthrough. We're then going to start capturing all these villages and cities fast. But nope. Progress in the Donbass is extraordinarily slow for the Russian ground forces. And I see these videos every day. I don't mention them to you. I'll link this one down below. But the ground forces of Russia are a spectacle to watch. It's an absolute clown show on the battlefield every single day. Russian commanders just order their troops to die in all these failed meat assaults. So this video in particular is pretty weird. Uh, there's a bunch of dudes riding on top of this tank to assault a Ukrainian position. Of course, it hits a mine or it's hit by a drone or something. And then you see all these guys riding on top scatter into the field. And there were something like 24 of these Russian soldiers standing on this single tank going into battle. Uh, Russia is losing armor at a horrendous rate. I can't imagine how they could ever keep up these rates of loss for another year or two. But the reason why Russia indiscriminately kills civilians, terrorizes people, is because they want Ukraine to surrender. Russia would love to capture the city of Kharkiv, a real city, a city that if they actually took it, I think even I would be impressed. But I'm going to say to you definitively, Russia is never going to capture this city. 
a city of uh, with the surrounding area almost 2 million people. But Kharkiv is 1.4 million people. To put this in perspective, the population of the city of Kharkiv is larger than the country of Estonia. The only way Russia can advance is if they destroy every single building, kill every single person, and then their incompetent ground forces just walk right in. It would be cheaper, faster, and easier for the Russians to invade Estonia, kill every person and destroy every building, than the Ukrainian city of Kharkiv. So I'm confident Kharkiv is going to hold, but the Russians are going to continue this campaign of terror, hoping they can force a negotiation in which Ukraine just gives them the city. It's not going to happen, but that's what the Russians want. Hundreds of small power plants, Ukraine Negro reveals strategy to protect against Russian strikes. Decentralization of electricity production throughout Ukraine, seen as the only way to protect the energy system from the severe consequences of Russian attacks. Russia eventually will destroy all of Ukraine's power plants. The only way for Ukrainians to have electricity going forward is a decentralized system. Lots of generators, lots of um, solar and wind plants. But this article is talking about creating micro thermal, thermal generation. So normally you burn coal, heats water, creates steam, steam drives turbines, that's how you generate electricity. So these smaller thermal generation plants that are going to be scattered everywhere uh, will run on waste. Waste from woodworking, industry, agriculture, and anything that burns. But it won't be on a scale that you would use in a normal coal fire burning power plant. Ukraine's going to innovate. They're going to do what they have to do. And I think there's a lot of brilliant uh, and helpful people living in the West that's going to get them the tools and resources to build all of these micro power plants. Russian forces ramp up pressure on Ukraine's eastern front. I want to share this clip. This is from DW News. These are Ukrainian defenders ready to do their job, ready to fight the Russians. All they need are the shells and the weapons to get the job done. The situation is bad, not many shells. They were scarce before, and now there are practically no shells. What we are given is for half an hour's work at most. To go on a mission, fire everything, and that's it. There's no more shells. We hold them back, but not very well, because there are no shells. If there were shells, they would not have advanced so far. We need shells. If we have shells, we will have everything. So let's talk about it. Who's fighting the hardest for Ukraine? And I saw this video from David Cameron, former Prime Minister of the UK. I think he's currently the Secretary of State for the UK. And he attended NATO's 75th uh, summit last week. And this is a pretty slick video he put out, and I want to share this video with you guys. So I've spent two days at the NATO conference here in Brussels. My challenge is to try and explain everything we're going to do now before I leave this conference center and get into the car. When people come to NATO conferences like this, they make a lot of speeches, they read them out, and they're good speeches, they're important points, but I think people often wonder, well, what's going to happen next? So let me tell you what I think we need to do. We had an incredibly clear exposition from the Ukrainian foreign minister about what his country needs to make sure it can prevail against Russia after the illegal invasion. He couldn't have been more clear. So let me tell you the things I'm going to do. First thing, all of us, every foreign minister knows, needs to go back to their country, get hold of their defense minister and ask what more can we do to help Ukraine in terms of air defense. They suffered in March alone over 700 missile and drone attacks. We've got to do more. Britain already does a massive amount. Trained 60,000 Ukrainian soldiers, given them £7 billion. The first to provide equipment like long-range weapons and tanks and anti-aircraft weapons. But we've got to do more. Next thing we've all got to do is get to our treasuries, get to our chancellors, get to our finance ministers, 
and say, what are we going to do to make sure we use these frozen Russian assets to help Ukraine to pay for this war and pay for the reconstruction of their country? There are creative things that we can do. One day, Russia is going to have to pay reparations for its illegal invasion of Ukraine. And when it does that, that can pay back the money that now needs to be given to Ukraine to help them in what they're doing. Next thing we've got to do is all of us, but particularly those who aren't spending 2% of their GDP on defence, have got to fix a meeting with their Prime Minister or with their President and say, we have got to make good that spending. Britain has done that, indeed, between 2020 and 2025, an extra 24 billion going into defence. But we need to do more, and I'm sure that we will. Final thing we've got to do, get on the phone to Speaker Johnson in the House of Representatives in Congress in America. Britain's put forward its money for Ukraine this year, so's the European Union. America needs to do it. That is blocked in Congress. Speaker Congress, Speaker Johnson can make it happen in Congress. I'm going to go and see him next week and say we need that money. Ukraine needs that money. It is American security, it's European security, it's Britain's security that's on the line in Ukraine, and they need our help. Bravo. That was a fantastic video. I shared this on Twitter. I wanted to share it in its entirety with you guys. The British have been crystal clear about the threat from Russia and the need to support Ukraine. It's in Europe's uh, best interests as far as security. It's in America's best interest as far as security. So David Cameron says he's meeting with Speaker Johnson next week or this week. And I hope he makes it awkward. I hope when David Cameron sits down in Speaker Johnson's office, he gets in the chair and he stares down this little troll and says, what the hell is wrong with you? What the hell are you doing helping the Russians? As an American, please, I need more foreign leaders, more people from countries around the world to apply pressure to Speaker Johnson. He feels comfortable doing what he's doing if he thinks no one will notice how insanely corrupt and evil it is. Republican infighting threatens further delay of stalled Ukraine aid package in the U.S. House. Divisions within the Republican Party in the U.S. House of Representatives, including a threat to remove Speaker Mike Johnson, have led to a threat to further delay the approval of vital aid. So when Speaker McCarthy was moved by Matt Gates last October or November, we didn't have a Speaker of the House for three weeks. Absolutely nothing could get done. So if Mike Johnson were to allow a vote on military aid for Ukraine, then the pro-Russia caucus, like Marjorie Trader Green, would just try to remove him and not have a Speaker of the House, have the chair just be vacant to help Russia advance on the battlefield. Here's a tweet from Timothy Schneider, professor at Yale. Uh, he's basically saying what I've been saying here on the channel for weeks. I don't think Ukraine aid is going to pass without a discharge petition that allows a simple vote. I do think what Johnson is doing now is specifically designed to prevent the discharge petition from getting enough votes. Speaker Johnson wants to introduce a House version of aid for Ukraine in the form of a loan. But if the House passes a different version, it's got to go back to the Senate, get 60 votes. If the Senate changes anything, it's got to go back to the House again to get more, to get re-voted on. And Johnson could just never schedule a vote for that. If the House introduces an alternate version of military aid for Ukraine, we're going to lose potentially months. The easiest and fastest and best way is just to sign the discharge petition in the House, pass the identical version of the Senate bill, and get this done. So what Speaker Johnson is doing by bringing up uh, Ukraine, he is giving members of Congress an excuse not to sign the discharge petition. So Speaker Johnson, to help Russia, is telling House Republicans, don't sign that discharge petition I've got something better coming. Wait for my version of aid for Ukraine. For the last six months, all of Johnson's ploys have had the same logic. 
make a promise, create some hope, generate excuses for European and executive branch inaction, weaken Ukraine, advance Russian genocide. Press coverage dwells on hope rather than recalling that Johnson's entire record thus far as speaker involves dishonest gambits to prevent Ukraine funding. If you're a member of Congress, please just uh, sign the discharge petition. So here's the website for the clerk's office for the House of Representatives. This is House Resolution 1016, introduced by James McGovern. I'll put this link down below if you want to bookmark it. But it shows what members of the House have signed it on what dates. So the discharge petition was introduced on March 12th. And these are all the House Democrats who have uh, signed it thus far. If we scroll down, I can show you on March 21st, Ken Buck of Colorado also signed it. He's the only House Republican. He's currently uh, resigning from Congress in protest of Donald Trump. He's a Republican. But we're at 191, and we have to get 218. So we need 218 minus uh, 191. I, I think that's 27 additional House members. Perhaps we can convince a couple more House Democrats who hate Israel to also sign it just to be a team player. But we're going to need about 20 House Republicans to do the right thing. President Zelensky meets with a bipartisan U.S. Congress delegation, asks them to pass Ukraine aid bill. So the delegation included Republicans, Joni Erst, Ashley Hinson, and Chuck Edwards. Joni Erst is a senator. The Senate's already passed the bill. She doesn't matter. But what the heck? Ashley Hinson, House Republican, and Chuck Edwards, House Republican. If you care enough to go to Ukraine yourself and meet with President Zelensky, then just sign the discharge petition. It's not complicated. If you support Ukraine, just get this done. All we have to do is get to 218. I hope in the next week or two, House Republicans who support Ukraine will realize that Johnson is lying to them, and Johnson is doing everything he can to help the Russians. In the meantime, things in Russia keep breaking. Russia evacuates over 4,000 people after a dam burst. Emergency services have been working through the night after a dam burst in the city of Orsk. This is near the Kazakh border. So this is where the city is, and it was a relatively small dam. Uh, Russian state media did put out a video showing the devastation and destruction of this Looks like a pretty poor Russian town, to be honest. But the leading theory why the dam failed, it wasn't a Ukrainian drone strike or missile strike, lack of proper maintenance. Because this war has been going on for two years and Russia is neglecting their civilian population and civilian services, dams are just spontaneously rupturing in Russia. Speaking of dam, we got a new video of the destruction of the Novokokovka hydroelectric power plants. This was destroyed by the Russians last year, prior to Ukraine's summer counteroffensive. And this is the moments after the Russians blew it up. And in this video, there are Russian soldiers laughing, giggling. They think this is hilarious. The dam is being ripped apart from... A torrent of water. I don't know if I can show this or not, so I'll link this down below if you want to see the video for yourself. Pipeline explosion in Russia disrupts oil transports in the early hours of April 6 in the Azov region of Rostov Oblast. Somebody sabotaged another uh, oil pipeline. But we're gonna have a pretty interesting summer. Given what's happening with all these oil refineries going offline, here's the price of ice Brent crude. This is global prices for oil. And you can see uh, Ukraine began this campaign of targeting Russian refineries on about January 7th, 
and we've gone from $76 a barrel to $91. Now, why does destroying refineries cause the price of crude to go up? And if Russia can't refine, they're not going to pump. Uh, they're going to have to reduce output in their wells because there's nowhere for the crude to go if they've lost all this refining capacity. They're still trying to uh, export and, and sell their crude abroad, but they don't have the infrastructure, they don't have enough tankers to get it out. This is going to affect global energy prices. I think uh, the price of oil probably will hit $100 a barrel by the summer. Because I do think Ukraine is going to continue attacking these refineries. For fun, I'm looking at the price of uh, Chevron. This is an oil company here in the United States. Year to date, up 8%. Exxon Mobil is up 18%. So it's going to get crazy. All right, let's get to the good news for Ukraine. South Korea, Dehan Minguk, announced they're going to donate $2.3 billion in aid to Ukraine this year. This will include a medium and long-term aid package. I used to live in South Korea for six years. I absolutely love the Korean people. Komap Samnida. South Korea also announced they'll be sending an additional 70 ambulances uh, stocked with medical equipment and supplies. Thank you so much to the people of South Korea. Lithuania has delivered a new batch of M577 tracked armored personnel carriers to Ukraine. They didn't specify the number, but thank you so much to the people of Lithuania. Lithuania additionally will produce 3,000 drones worth about 15 million euros, and they also said they're going to help rehabilitate wounded Ukrainian soldiers. Thank you so much to the people of Lithuania. Serbia has provided Ukraine with a significant financial grant of about 32 million U.S. dollars. This is weird because Serbia is historically an ally of Russia, but Ukraine did confirm that Serbia gave Ukraine this grant. So, thank you so much to the people of Serbia. Final clip I have for you. Not a feel-good one. Russia has been conducting these double, double tap strikes to kill first responders. Russia is trying to kill uh, firefighters, police officers, and paramedics. Uh, last week, I, I shared that heartbreaking video of a young firefighter who responded to a call and found that his father, also a firefighter, had been killed in one of these double tap strikes. So this is the firefighter department uh, having a, a memorial service for their fallen brother. Russia will be defeated. That's all for this update video. Glory to Ukraine, glory to the heroes. If you found this video informative, give me a thumbs up. Best way to support the channel. Comments and questions, let me know down below. I love hearing from you guys. Till the next video, keep defending the truth, keep defending democracy.